is Ed Schneider, and on behalf of the Bronx County Historical Society, I would like to welcome you to our annual tour of the Fordham area of the Bronx on this Saturday, the 22nd day of September 2001. I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> I just want to welcome you all to our annual tour of the Fordham area. We start here at Poe Park and the Poe area because this is probably the oldest building left in existence in the area. This cottage built as a summer home for in the Valentine family in 1812 originally was across the street where you see this uh, yellow uh, sign on the red apartment building. It was moved here in 1913 because with the uh, widening of Kingsbridge Avenue and the building of the apartment buildings we see around us, uh, this area was growing tremendously in the beginning part of the century. Where we are standing was originally called the village of Fordham sometimes the village of Kingsbridge, because we are so close to the border between Fordham and Kingsbridge. The land originally, of course, owned by the Native Americans of the area, the Algonquins, and then the Dutch, and then the English. The area was very slow to develop at this point in the Bronx because of transportation. It's hard for us to imagine that 200 or 300 years ago before the railroad, to get from Lower Manhattan up here took 14, 15 hours in a horse-drawn vehicle. Not until the coming of the railroads in the 1820s and 1830s did the periphery areas become open to us along the Hudson, along the East River. This central area literally remained farmland well into the beginnings of the 20th century. The Bronx really developed in two different directions. It moved from the south to the north, and it moved from the west to the east, with a little bit of building along the east. But this central area where we're standing was basically empty until the beginnings of this century. If we jump to, oh, I would say, let's say about 1900, you would find the center of the Bronx's um, residential and shopping area to be in what was called the hub, approximately 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. This is where most of the people began to live in the Bronx as they moved out of Manhattan. The first elevated trains came up through that area, and so it developed rapidly. It grew not in the way Manhattan grew, with the tenement buildings, but it was still a very, very congested area. And then, uh, slowly after the First World War, people began to move up into this area. If we look around at the apartment buildings that we see here, 90% of them were built between 1924 and 1929. The rest, predominantly between 1934 and 1940. We can tell the difference, basically, in the architecture. That the majority of buildings, with its open courtyard, with its, some of them are non-elevated, some of them are elevated, have that castle palace look of the 1920s. The uh, buildings built in the 1940s, like the buildings straight here across the street, are what we call art deco, artistic decoration. These are the buildings that were built uh, all right after the Depression until the beginnings of the Second World War. And the architecture was quite different. But in the early 20s is where our story begins. Now we're going to walk to this new center because this is where the Bronx in this area develops. We're going to walk in three different directions. We're going to walk south, we're going to walk east, and then we're going to walk west. How far? And then we may have to come back. Uh, the only thing I'm thinking, maybe I wouldn't have to come back. You're walking with him, right? Do you think it's possible if we run over? You could just walk back for me and put the money in the meter for me? 
All right, just before we go, my car is the it's uh, the gold and uh, brown top, and it's got a blue card inside that says um, mm -hmm. thing. There's a got the message that this didn't really look very nice for people coming from other parts of the world, and so as you can see, they have really done quite a. You can by the spring, this will be all grass, all flowers. They did leave the gazebo. What happened here was all oh, around 1913. When they moved the Poe Cottage here, they took this two and a half acres and they made it into a park so that the residents of the area could have a place to sit out. If you came by here on a Friday night or a Saturday night, they would have a band playing in the gazebo where you could have people singing or people dancing, etc. Well, that ended, I guess, somewhere in the 1950s. And the building almost was ready to fall down. They didn't tear it down, they left it. And then recently, I'd say, oh, the last 10 or 15 years, uh, the local residents have begun, begun to come out and use it. Teenagers will come with the boom boxes, and you'll find people singing and dancing using mechanical methods. Here at the corner of 192nd Street, we come to the beginnings of the modern hub of the Bronx. From here to approximately 183rd Street, going south, is what we would call the hub. It is bordered, as I said, 183rd to the south, approximately uh, Webster Avenue, Southern Boulevard to the east, University Avenue to the west, and just about here to the north. This, the Ortez Funeral Home originally was a men's department store called Robert Hall. Anybody remember? Well, I don't know if we have any people. Yeah. By the way, I see some of us are about my age, so if I make a mistake or I come up with one that's wrong, please correct me. I basically, you see, I don't use notes. I was born here. I was brought up here. I was born on 182nd and Valentine Avenue, which is roughly uh, two or three blocks away, and I grew up in Bedford Park. Uh, and we're talking about, in my case, predominantly, uh, my memory goes back to the late 1940s through the 1960s and through the changes. So much of what we talk about are things that I do remember. For example, Robert Hall uh, was one of the places uh, my parents took me to because as a teenager, it was pretty much of a, of a bargain. We'll see some of the other clothing stores as we go by. Wasn't Robert Hall on the concourse on the Fordham Road? No, Robert Hall was here. There was one in this in No, well, we're just, we're just talking about our area here. As you can see, the apartment buildings that start at this point have no ground floor. All of the ground floors are stores of some kind. For example, this grocery store, if you look carefully the way it looks, it hasn't changed much. It originally was a candy store. And if you use a little bit of imagination, you can almost picture it as being an apartment store. We have also passed there was a, um, a small restaurant here called Corky's. Now, I don't know, I haven't had a chance to go in, if it's the same Corky's. But originally, Corky, C-O-R-K-Y, was a restaurant down here. We're going to pass this in a few minutes, uh, a little bit closer to the subway. The main reason that this area develops is because of the independent subway, the Jerome Avenue and the Webster Avenue being in such close proximity at this point. And so beginning all around 1927 to 1928, this center of Bronx uh, living and the businesses begins to move out of 134th, 135th, 138th, Southern Boulevard, Simpson Street, and begins to relocate here. Uh, one of the first, of course, uh, organizations here was the Dollar Savings Bank. 
uh, started out as a very small building, uh, maybe only the first half of this. This tower was built in the late 1940s. In fact, it's still, they didn't change some of the tiling. It still says Dollar Savings Bank, although Dollar Savings Bank has been out of business for, for many, many years. Now, one of the reasons that the area developed so rapidly was due to a man by the name of Farkas, F-A-R-K-A-S. Mr. Farkas was a very shrewd businessman who began to catch on to this idea that people would save time if they could go to one store for many different items. Up until this point, whether we talk about food or clothing, if you wanted a hat, you went to a milliner. If you wanted a suit, you went to a, uh, a um, pants and jacket man. If you wanted a shirt, you went into a shirt store. If you wanted vegetables, you went into a vegetable store. The idea of department store, one building having many departments, was fairly new. Mr. Farkas opened his first such store at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in what had been the hub. But then in the 1920s, seeing the handwriting on the wall, he came up here and he opened up a small store Oh, just about where the windows are in the building across the street. And named after one of his children, he called the store Alexander's. And all throughout the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, Alexander's was the reason for every other store to have been here. Little by little, like an octopus, it grew and it grew. It grew, taking over all the buildings going, south, taking all the buildings going uh, east. In fact, this last piece, which you can see is separate, was an apartment building. They actually bought, Mr. Farkas bought the apartment building, tore it down, and built this annex. Next door to it, where we see the sign that says American Dental Center, was a very nice family restaurant called Carol's. Spelt with a double R and a double L. And so people going shopping had a nice place. Basically, it was a breakfast and lunch, but they did serve dinner. One of the things that we're going to notice, at least that I have noticed, if you had been here back in the 50s or 60s, this neighborhood has changed very, very little. The store names have changed. The ethnic background has changed changed but then again that's the history of the Bronx the Bronx has always been the home to many many different peoples all the way back from the Dutch to the Hispanic and uh, Asiatic people of today and so store names may have changed but the principle is the same unfortunately and nobody can figure out why nobody seems to be able to make uh, a change since Alexander's went out of business about 15 years ago. Caldors opened up here. Well, we all know what happened to Caldors. I myself, I'm wondering how come with all the shopping up here that either a Kmart or a Walmart has not come into the area. Yet, this is something that may yet still happen because this huge building being empty doesn't really make much sense to the economic well-being of the area. By the way, if we turn around, we'll see 1933 was the year the Dallas Savings Bank came here, which is interesting, isn't it? 1933, where most banks were going out of business, here we have a new bank starting out. The building over empty now? The building right now is empty. It's been empty? It has been empty since Cal... Well, this was one of the first Caldor stores that closed down. Get nearer to the subway, of course, you had people paying higher and higher rents. Where this uh, home fashion store is today was one of the most famous bakeries in all of the Bronx, a place called Sutter's, S U T T E R S. And it was a place you could buy cake or you could go in on a Saturday morning, like we are now, and order a coffee and cake and biscuits. Take it from me, 
their cookies, except for Addie Valens, was one of the most delicious bakery goods baked anywhere in the world. And they had been here for many, many years. Along these stores all just have changed what they do. As I say, this breakfast and lunch place was a restaurant called Corky's. You got off the subway, you had a place to get a cup of coffee or going, or going back in again. On the corner, there was a very, very fancy men's shop. Now it's a woman's shop called Ben Hill. B-E-N-H-I-L-L. -L. They sold shirts, ties, basically sports clothes. The three corners had a loft candy, a barracini candy, and a cigar store. This was a tree. Here, where we are standing right now, was considered to be the center of the borough of the Bronx for well over 30 years. As we can see by the amount of pedestrians today, it really hasn't changed very much, only the stores. For example, here at the corner where it says Kids and Foot Locker was the 5 and 10, a Woolworth. There were two of them in the neighborhood, one up here and one down a little bit further, which we will see a little bit later. Along here, we see Bon Bami, we see oh, uh, One Day. This has, the names have changed but the type of store was exactly the same. Here, beginning with 1942, we had two recruiting stations. It's odd that we should be talking about this today. Uh, on this side, it was the Navy and the Army Air Corps, and there was another building on the other side that was for the uh, Army, for the Navy and the Marines. Uh, all about 20 years ago, I think in one of the hurricanes, one of these, these have been temporary structures for 60 years. <laughs> that one finally collapsed, and I guess with the ending of conscription, I'm making a volunteer only, they combined them together, as it says now, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, they're all back together. It'll be interesting to see in the next few months or so, it doesn't grow up. Well, we're going to concentrate on this side. Let's walk, we're going to walk east. This recruiting station is yeah. still open, yes. It has been open, 1942. Yeah, I remember, sure. The one thing that the area is lacking are the dinosaurs. We are missing our dinosaurs, the movie theaters. There isn't one left. Outside of, what we'll come to a little bit later, the Lowy's Paradise building is still standing. Is it still a movie house? It is closed for renovation right now, and it's going to open up, hopefully, after the renovations are finished, it's going to open up as a dance uh, and a theater uh, a grouping. It can support movie, the movie theaters. Here next to Ben Hill, where we have Fordham Eyes, was what we called back then a third-run movie house called the Concourse Theater, named after where it was, the Concourse. And it was a kind of a theater, if you missed the movie downtown, and you missed the movie at the Paradise, and you missed the movie at the Grand, it wound up here. Sort of like when we get the rental today, uh, this was the last one. And it was a double bill, but it showed you could get in for like half price. On the corner, was what we call a second run. This was a, this was the RKO Fordham. Unfortunately, the building itself, uh, well after the theater had closed, burnt to the ground, and it was replaced with this modern style building that you see here today. But it was the second um, theater in a row, followed by a third theater, which we will come to, called the Valentine, which is off out. This street here is Valentine Avenue, uh, named after Mr. Valentine, who was one of the big landowners in this area. Uh, some of the names, the names really, I'm only picking out the important names, but each one of these individual stores did cater to a particular type of clientele. And in an era where there were no bargains, 
You are in the half of flea markets. Uh, the department store was something new. There were still, especially ladies, uh, wanted to be individually helped. Uh, some of these names will come in, like here where you see strawberries, was a very famous women's store, sports store called Plymouth Shops. They had stores all over New York, but this was their Fordham branch. That's new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess they can't handle all that little building. These top, uh, some of these, uh, were, well, we go further down, some of them were stores, some of them were catering halls. Some of you might remember some of the names like the Senate Catering Hall, down by Shipman. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. It's interesting that Lane Bryant has opened a store here at the time that the Plymouth shop was across the street. They didn't have the nerve to come up here. Where it says hyperactive, next to the Plymouth shop was another very famous men's clothing store called Ripley's. And where it says Young World was another men's shop called Howard Clothes. This was a... Where was Wallace? Wallace was on this... Wallace was the next one down. Oh, I see you come from this area. No, but we used to oh. buy at Wallace. And, and Ripley and the other place you mentioned. These were are here on the corner. Oh, not the, oh, the base is still here. See the block this young man is sitting on? That used to have a clock. And the clock had a big advertisement for the jewelry store that stood here called Maddow's. And most, uh, again, it was for men and women, but most women who had a little extra money to spend came to Maddow's jewelry because they had a uh, reputation. Now, see, I mixed it up. All right, no. Ripley's was where this leather goods store is. This, where it says hyperactive, was called Needix. They sold hot dogs and coffee and orange juice. They latter on were taken over by um, chock full of nuts. And they, he, they were here for a short time, too. building, white building of course was not here. That is today uh, the Bronx Center offices for the government of the borough of the Bronx, uh, the United Federation of Teachers, that was not there. But the building that we see, the slightly white building there which is today uh, run by Sears, if we look at old pictures, See, I am getting older. The name just... Rogers. Rogers. Thank you. Rogers and Company, they sold silver dishes, china. They were almost like the type of store that Sears would be today. Uh, the type of stores that we're looking at, absolutely no different from when the hub was built. And more or less, you can just barely make out the uh, edge of Webster Avenue, of course, at that, in the 50s, there was an elevated train there. The old 3rd Avenue came up out of Manhattan and continued up along Webster Avenue. It has been replaced by buses and was back as early as 1954, 1955, and more or less going in an easterly direction, that would be the end of what was called the hub. But the type of stores that we're looking at, 
Their names may be different, but they are the same. We're now going to turn around and retrace our steps and go in the opposite direction. The, um, <laughs> efforts to say where they live. For example, uh, people would say, well, I live on Valentine Avenue, one block east of the concourse. Or I live on Valentine Avenue, two blocks east of the concourse. My mother knew a woman who once said she lived on a certain, certain street nine blocks east of the concourse. That is how much this uh, came about. By the way, to show you that I'm not a very good businessman. Orloff Avenue, which is behind Scott Towers, uh, near behind Clinton High School, off Broadway, and I grew up in Bedford Park. Bedford Park, and when I was first born, I lived on a small street called Knox Place, which is on the end of Jerome Avenue. So I really lived most of my life here. And uh, the road. It is the only place on the concourse that they did this. Why? Because they knew because they knew that the building of this area was gonna have such a tremendous amount of traffic that there was no way. I mean if you go down the concourse all the way to the end, the further you go to the place on Hunter Tremont Avenue, uh, Burnside Avenue, you get stopped for the lights. I mean it's a hard way to get through. This is the only place where they dropped the concourse on the ground. And when was that done? When they built it. When was that built? Uh, from approximately 1903 to probably just before the First World War. You know what, we'll break it up, we'll head south, and then we'll cross over, and then we'll head east. This really, for so many years, was the center of the universe for most people who lived in the Bronx. There was absolutely not a single thing made anywhere in the world that you could not buy somewhere in this 25 or 30 square block area. The only thing I guess would be a lot different was if you came by here on a Sunday. It was dead. Is Sears still open there? Sears is still open there, yes. And they have been since they took it over from the Rogers and Company. Okay. I saw people cloud closing because the light changed. <laughs> yeah. Hadn't changed here. There's always was a place for major accidents. <laughs> this building used to have a name, I forgot. The... It still does. It's called the Wagner Building. The Wagner Building. I, I was looking for the name. I didn't see it. The Wagner Building is probably the only office building that was built in the area until they built this big uh, complex in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Again, the train made it such a convenient place to come and to shop. Royal Florist has been here at least, at least 60 years. Because even when I can remember being a little boy, maybe three or four years old, and coming up here with my mother or my aunt, and the Royal Florist was here. So this door has been here for quite a long time. M and D. Take away the word discount shop. The name stays the same. 1940, I'm gonna go back and do a little personal thing. Go back to 1943. I can remember standing outside of this door with my mother and my aunt waiting with the coupon books to buy nylon stockings. This was one of the very few places in the area that you could get nylons during World War II. And you were, if I remembered, they stood online forever looking for one pair, and that's all you could get. No. You, well, I remember my mother saying when you ran out, you took a pencil, you drew a line up your back to make sure the seams were straight. As I said, the Wagner building has been here since the 1920s, and uh, it is, was the only office building in the area. 
across the street, uh, Net Florsheim has also, I, and I don't know if they're out of business or why they're closed, but they were there for many, 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 many years. Where it says Funko Land was a very, very famous uh, perfume where they made the perfume for you. They are still in business. About 25 years ago, they moved up to uh, Cross County. And they are in Cross County today. I'm not telling you the name because as I walk, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It had a very French name. C'est bon. C'est bon. C-E-B-O-N. And they made the perfume for you. Here, this is interesting. Siemens Furniture occupies a building that had been a furniture place way back from the very beginnings of the Fordham area. Above the sign, the sign originally was a very small sign, and there was a glass window in which they had the furniture displayed. It was part of a very large chain of furniture stores like Siemens called Saks. And their ad, their jingle, the things that we remember, that was their telephone number, Melrose 5, 5 300. And now I need to sing the song and put it out. So you see, what goes around does come around. A furniture store taken by a furniture store. But they will quote a chain furniture store. If you really wanted to have a personalized furniture, this is not where you came. I'll show you where we went. By the way, the rules of laws have been changed. This, in the 1930s, 1940s, was illegal. You could not sell anything on the street in the, on the Grand Concourse. Why? Uh, it was simply, again, they didn't want to dirty the neighborhood. It was simply, again, they wanted to do away with what they showed in Manhattan, the street vendor, that you had to be in a store. Truthfully, I don't know if it's legal even now. The cops may just not bother. Here, Radio Shack and this People's Bargain was one huge store, the most famous ice cream and candy maker probably in the borough of the Bronx. It was a place called Crumbs, K-R-U-M apostrophe S. This is where, when if you were on a date and you came out of the theater and you could afford it, you came uh, for ice cream. Later on, they were joined back on Kingsbridge Road near a theater called the Windsor Theater by a place called um, Jans, J-A-H-N-S. But Crumbs was the number one place to come if you came from the theater for a date. Jans also in Queens? There was a Jans in Queens too, yes. They, in fact, they started in Queens and then they came to the Bronx. When did they close? Uh, they closed, yeah, I would say about 1970, 1968, somewhere in the late 60s, early 1970s. Crumbs shrank. It was smaller and smaller and smaller and then they disappeared. Next to them, just about here, was probably Again, when you wanted fine stationery, if you wanted your name put on your stationery, if you needed any kind of school supplies, you came to Shipman's, S-H-I-P-M-A-N-S, -S, another small store that got larger and larger. On the corner, see, I'm only going by the ones I remember, was a, tux, was a, a tuxedo place where you rented a tuxedo, and the reason you might come here was the top here, where it says center, was a place called the Senate Caterers. Under it was a knick-knack shop, uh, a place to buy uh, doodads, lamps, a uh, coffee table, cocktail table called Epters, E-P-T-E-R-S. There were many, many such stores in, in, in the neighborhood. 
Now, once again, we are coming to a place that is probably uh, well known all over the world. By the way, you didn't, if you wanted to, you see how large the Fordham Railroad uh, platform is. You could either get all out of the train at the concourse, or you could come up here and be right across the street from, well, the center of all theaters. This is, um, well, every time I come, I hope that the story is going to get better. The Lois Paradise Theater, this was the optimum in, um, in movie theaters. Uh, the Lowe's Corporation in New York City built four theaters that originally, they weren't built as movie theaters, they were built as burlesque and, uh, as, burlesque and as uh, vaudeville houses. Uh, in Queens, it's called the Valencia. In Brooklyn, it's called the Lowe's Fox. And all three of them had a different motif. The uh, Lois Valencia in Queens, its background was Spanish. The Lois Fox was French. And the uh, Lois Paradise here was Italian. I'm sorry, I had that backwards. I changed that. The Queens, the Valencia is Italian. No, no. This was built right. in the Spanish the style. Valencia right. is in Spanish style. I've been in it in the old days when it was. Right. So this was built in the Italian. When you came in, first of all, what you will notice immediately <coughs> is something missing that you almost see on every single movie theater. This never had one. There is no marquee. It was a, the Grand Concourse on the Bronx refused to allow their rule to be broken that nothing should project out into the street. And so instead of the traditional marquee that stood out, the n names of the movies would appear it's, uh, they're working on it, right on the road it says Lowy's Paradise Theatre, and along the top of the wall, like the uh, New York Times building, was a moving light uh, that told you what was playing. This was the number one movie theatre in the Bronx, where your other theatres charged, oh, 50 cents or 75 cents in the 1930s, they were already charging a dollar. When you want to impress your date that you are not from the poor to people, this is where you come. I can remember coming in here originally saying, gee, they must have, not knowing they had built it, but they must have taken a palace from someplace in Europe and transported here. Actually, it was built in 1929. It didn't operate as a uh, vaudeville for long. Vaudeville was the one's way out. It was converted almost immediately to a movie theater by simply adding a screen. But uh, many high schools used the stage for many years for graduation. Uh, the decor inside was magnificent. It had beautiful fountains with fish actually in the fountains. The ceiling which was a, a key to all of this type of theater, was a rolling sky of stars and clouds. Uh, uh, when you sat in the balcony, you had the feeling that you were sitting outside. The lighting gave you the feeling that you were outside. Uh, to work there was probably one of the cherished dreams of all teenagers. I can remember, I went in for a job uh, when I was 16, and I was so happy they hired me for the summer. Unfortunately, well, I only had the job for 10 minutes. They could not find a uniform. I was as tall then as I am now. At 16, I was already six foot two, and they did not have a, um, a uniform. And that was what you wanted a job for. The <laughs> uniform was an army type uniform. You had braids, and you had a whistle, and you had a, a hat, and uh, it was really a nice thing to do. Didn't work out. At the top, you will notice above the clock, there is like a, a European-style church. Uh, it was it moved around and it, uh, and it chimed the hours. It has not worked in my time. But I understand that the man and the corporation that is working on it has been working on it, and they are uh, in the process of repairing it.
Now, I mentioned the idea of the fanciest uh, furniture store in the Bronx, where it says Lincoln Furniture was a store called Mallory's. And it was the name alone. If you said, oh, I bought my bedroom set in Mallory's, it meant that you had that couple of extra dollars to spend. The stores built into the Paradise Theater paid exorbitant rents even back then. There was a tuxedo store. There was a woman's hat store. Where it says ice, there was a small um, cafeteria type store uh, where you could go in and have a sandwich. But again, most people who could would come across and have uh, uh, come to crumbs. I can remember going on a date and, you know, it was a question of if I went to the theater and then I went to Crumbs, after I took the date home, I had to walk to 203rd Street and Valentine's because I didn't have the car fare. You didn't, weren't able to do both. It was a very, very different world. But the stores that we see, they, again, they may have a different name, but they serve the same general purposes. If we look where it says Petland, that was a delicatessen. So, if uh, most people of uh, um, the Jewish background would go into the delicatessen for a pastrami sandwich. Remembering, once again, we're talking about an era of before the pizza parlor. There was no such thing. There were Italian restaurants, but not pizza restaurants. Uh, where it says only vehicle showtime was a, a, a cafeteria style place called Bickford's. I didn't mention across from the five and 10, there was another cafeteria called the Brighton Cafeteria. And so, which was more or less like the Horn and Hard Art. There was a Horn and Hard Art down further south on Fordham Road. If we look, you can see, as we look down towards 181st, 180th, the stores are beginning to die out. Once you pass the paradise, the rents got less and less. The stores started to spread out until by the time you got to about 183rd Street, which had the Astor Theater, which has just gone out of business, you have no more storefronts and only stores. Even the side streets living in here were very expensive rents. We see here some of the earliest apartment buildings or multi-dwellings built in this area. These buildings would have predated Fordham Road becoming the hub. When we talk about Fordham Road becoming the hub, the center, we are talking any time after 1931, 1932, but it remains so today. This is still the center of the business area of the Bronx. Everything said about the theater. That's okay. But they show with a mall. Well, from what I understand, the gentleman who owns it and is replacing it, they are going to open it as a dance and a. Um, they are. Like yeah. yeah. Well, more than that, because luckily, what I didn't say is, oh, about 20 years ago, when the movie industry was really going out of it, they divided it into a multi-theater. There were four theaters in one, but luckily they didn't destroy anything. They simply put up plywood to separate it, and so when they started to restore it and they took down the plywood, all the or most of the original fittings are still there. And we still have our fingers crossed that they will restore it to the way it looked in the early 1930s. The inside of that, I can't describe it. It is absolutely magnificent, and luckily most of it is still there. You remember? Guys, yeah. yeah. Well, but I guess by the time you're too young, I think by the time you got there, it was already divided up, yeah. right? Well, hopefully it's going to be put back. Uh, we're going to have to stop back this way. Everybody okay? Is there maybe a story why this is such a significant intersection? 
that this has stayed one one level buildings that yeah it's zoned it's zoned, zoned. right we have this and this that's tall uh they were built probably before the as i said alexander's they did this probably about 1937. there have been very very few actual buildings built here in the last 60 years, yeah, they have just uh, re you know reallotted what they've got. Yeah. Notice the little park. Lorsheim Shoes, it's such a big business, they had two stores. I said the other ones, they must have closed the other store and just left this. This Cone's Fashion Optical was a um, optical shop for many, many years, but it wasn't a chain. Cone's is a chain. Here we had what was the back entrance to Alexander's. I think you'll get an idea of the immense size that this is. Who actually owns that property? I, I guess, I, I, I am assuming Caldor's though. The corporation, uh, they declared bankruptcy, so I guess whatever the bank was. Citibank has always been there. It was originally Citibank of New York, and it's been there. They've changed their labels, but they've been there for years. It used to be a Wall Street firm. Ira Halt someplace here on, on, uh, on Fordham Road. It would, well, it, it would have been upstairs. They would upstairs. not have had, right. They would not have had a down. Uh, and there was another one, I think, another logo that said grocery and deli over there. Yes. There was a, well, for many years, there was a women's store. Here was Hanscom's, where it says Dunkin' Donuts, was a Hanscom's bakery. You'll notice that this area is even more congested, in a way, than it was as we went south. Because we are in the area between the two trains. You've got the Independence Fordham Road station here, and you've got the Fordham Road Jerome Avenue station that we're coming up to. Now, Hollywood Linens. It used to be called the Nodley Shop. It sold the same things. A little fancier in that I think the, uh, they sold furniture, lamps, uh, tables, etc. But it's serving the same general purpose. coming to two of uh, probably the largest um, television, toasters, radios, electronic shops of the 50s, where it says Models, was a place called the Vigas. They also were part of a chain. And their competition was where it says Duane Reed, was a place called Vims, V-I-M-S. I guess I remember that because we bought our first television set in 1948 in the Vegas. And if you didn't like their price, you went across the street and they were usually beaten by a dollar or two. Although if I look back at it, I guess they were probably in cahoots. We also had another, where Kids World is, we had a, um, a Kresge's which was like, well, Kmart is Kresge's today, and, no, I'm sorry, that was the 5 and 10. Notice the proximity of two awards, one up opposite the RKO Theater, one here, and Kresge's was here on the corner, next to Vim's. Kresge's was the original name of Kmart, that's where they get the name Kmart. 
There were a few uh, restaurants. The church, of course, has been here for many, many, many years. Right at the point where the uh, subway is was a third uh, area movie theater, the Louis Grand. Also beautifully done, beautifully proportioned, looked like a small castle. Nowhere in like the Paradise. In fact, it was where the Paradise was a first run theater. It was a second run theater. And then there was one more theater on the other side of the uh, Jerome Avenue called the University. Right off University Avenue. So you can see the neighborhood supported four or five movie theaters and they all did a very, very brisk business. You would have to, I would think that the nearest place is probably Cross Century, they, uh, uh, Cross County, where they've opened up multiplex theaters. There are, there is no local theater. Most we have. Uh, one of the things I like, I'm a retired school teacher, and uh, I, you know, we teach a lot about the area and about the Bronx. And uh, the Bronx has always been a changing ethnic group. No matter what period of time we pick, you're going to find different people populating the Bronx at different times. This is why we are such a broad mix. Yes, in some areas, some groups move and some out and some move back in. For example, if we run a little bit further north up to the area around Bailey Avenue or Bainbridge Avenue, which was predominantly Irish for many, many, many years, they began to move out in the uh, 60s and 70s, and then with the troubles in Ireland, many began to move back, and the neighborhood again has become predominantly Irish. Uh, but you see, the whole concept of ethnicity, which is a hard word to pronounce, is really changing a great deal. And I think we see a great deal of this in what we're talking about when we're talking about New York today. This is what New York and all large cities are today. A conglomerate, a mixture. Just look around at the people we have passed today and uh, what is being said. I mean, to me, I find it very gratifying. The young man stopped us to talk. He was interested in what the area is or what the area was. And the same idea with the shops. The shops have different names. They may be owned by different people, but they are doing the same thing and not to be the dead horse but if we talk about the uh the goings on of the last 12 days this is something that most of the peoples of the world do not understand about the united states that our strength comes from the fact that we are made up of so many people it took a long time for them to publish uh in newspapers the amount of different people that the World Trade Center disaster wasn't just an American disaster. 200, I just read the figures this morning, 200 British uh, subjects died, 25 Canadian, 50 Ecuadorian, seven now, and I'm not going to go over the exact figures, but they had, if you look at the Daily News today, there's a listing of about 45 different countries who had somebody visiting or working in that building. And that's really what America, this is really what we're talking about. Now, before we start back, I have to collect more. This concludes our tour of the Fordham area. I want to thank you very much for coming on behalf of the Bronx County Historical Society. Have a good day.